All right, greetings, everyone. This is Eric Glazer, and welcome to our live recording of Bright Spots in Healthcare, produced by Shared Purpose Connect. Each episode, we bring leaders together to not only inform our audience, but also unearth bright, subs, bright spots, success stories at health plans, hospitals, and various other healthcare-related organizations around our country. Our goal is to identify as many bright spots as possible so that you, the listener, can determine if the ideas shared on our show can be applied at your organization. This approach of finding a bright spot and cloning it may be the most effective strategy you have to improving healthcare in all of our lifetime. I encourage you to subscribe to Bright Spots in Healthcare if you have not already. This way, you can have episodes drop right onto your tablet or phone, uh, and you can benefit from all of the expertise from all of the industry leaders we are fortunate enough to have on our program uh, each and every week. That's wherever you consume podcasts, Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you listen to shows, just type in Bright Spots in Healthcare. You can find it there and just click on subscribe. So thank you in advance for that. Today's title, today's episode is Human Holistic Approach to Social Determinants of Health, Reaching the Unreachable. Our sponsor today is our friends at Acario. If you have not heard of Acario, they are a health action platform that unites technology, data science, and behavioral insights to connect everyone to better health. You could check them out at acariohealth.com. I will spell that for you. I C A R I O health.com. I believe, and these are my words, uh, not theirs, that they are one of the true unicorns in healthcare because they're combining non or taking non healthcare thinking to drive better healthcare outcomes for all the people you take care of and that you ensure. I will tell you a little bit more about them later on in the show. We have an embarrassment of riches today. We have a lot to cover in what's about 58 minutes remaining. Uh, We're gonna save some time uh, by posting the bios of our four illustrious roundtable experts in the chat. For those listening to uh, the show via podcast, we're going to put that in the show notes. That way you get an, uh, an understanding of some of the great expertise you're about to benefit from. I will announce each one of our guests when I bring them on uh, into the conversation for the first time. And I want to just jump right into bright spots and examples. And so I'm gonna start with Ben Line, our Senior Vice President of Complex Member Services at United Healthcare Government Operations. Ben, I'd like you to provide an example or success story of how UHC is connecting with those hard to reach members. So let's just jump yeah. right in. All right, thanks, Eric. Uh, very happy to be here with this group today. Um, so just a little bit of background, UHC is a program that we launched about two years ago in 2020 that provides each of our DSNIP or our dual special needs members with their own dedicated navigator. <laughs> These navigators are non-clinical and they're focused on helping members access and coordinate services across their Medicare and their Medicaid benefits and access mental health and pharmacy and dental and other support. Also spend quite a bit of time helping members that are struggling with social barriers, everything from transportation to food and housing insecurity. Um, we're trying to really arm each of our DSNIT members with their own dedicated healthcare concierge. Um, I have operational responsibility for this program and, and we're really focused on three main areas. First and foremost is how are we reaching and engaging members and in getting them into this program? Um, we do this in the traditional outbound calling ways, you know, outbound calling and campaigns. Uh, when members enroll, we introduce them to the program and try to get them connected to their navigator. We will make several outbound calling attempts spread over several weeks to try to reach these members and engage them and follow up with emails where we can and our email data is not great, but where we have it, we use it. But all in, these, these outbound activities engage less than half of our members in this navigation program. So the majority of our member engagement is created when our members are calling into us, UHC. Uh, they might call member services or call one of our nurses or one of our support programs. So uh, a simple example of this would be a member who has a question about a, 
a benefit, might call the number on the back of their card. When they call in, they're going to speak to one of our member service representatives. And, and that rep representative at that point in time receives an alert that this member has a navigator. They have not yet engaged with that navigator. And from that alert, the representative, well, they'll first answer their question, but then they'll introduce the navigator navigation program to them and connect the member with their navigator. And the navigator takes it from there. So most of our actual engagement comes from members calling us for some unrelated or other reason. And we use that contact to, to get them into our navigation program. Through the combination of the outbound tactics and our inbound tactics, um, we're able to engage about 90% of our DCNET members into this navigation program. So engagement, that's the, the first area of focus because if we're not engaging with and speaking with this me these members, there's not much else we can do. Second area of focus, which is near and dear to me, is ensuring that we're providing great support and service to each of our members. Uh, we measure that in two separate ways. Once at the point of the call, we have a post-call survey with a customer satisfaction survey that accompanies that. And we do very strongly in that, typically running 96, 97% satisfaction. So strong, strong numbers. The more impressive thing from my perspective is that we measure the relationship side. How do our members feel about the navigation program? And one or two months after they've engaged in the program, we send them a, an email survey asking them the typical NPS net promoter score question. And our NPS score has been remarkably strong. Over the last six months, we've been in the mid eighties for an NPS. And for those of you familiar with that, wow. that's pretty amazing. So, Two compelling proof points that our members like the DSNP navigation. Ben, just, yeah. just for context yeah. for everyone, uh, I just read an article yesterday, like the average NPS in healthcare right now is in the mid 30s. So just yeah. as a balance against what you guys have been able to achieve. Well, well yeah. done. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. And it's, you know, I, it's proof that our members like this program. Actually, it's probably more proof that our members love their navigators. It's not so much about the program, it's about that relationship between a member and someone helping them. Um, the third and final area that I'll just say that I focus on within our, our decent navigation program is how do we focus on the outcomes, the closing the gaps in care? Our main objective with DSNP navigation is to get our members into their physicians, um, get them in for a PCP visit, an annual wellness visit, make sure they're talking to their primary care physician about their specialist care or any other care they're receiving. This is really our true north, uh, ensuring that our members have a positive and active relationship with their primary care physician. In addition to that, we also focus on social determinants of health barriers. Obviously, if a member doesn't have transportation, they can't get to their doctor, they can't get to the pharmacy. If they're worrying about where they're going to sleep tomorrow or where they're going to get their next meal, it's tough to get them to think about scheduling a PCP visit a couple weeks out. So we do spend a lot of time addressing those barriers that stand between them and engaging in a positive way. And then we also have alerting mechanisms if the member is overdue for screenings like a mammogram or a colorectal screening, if their medication refills are, are lapsing, if they're not taking their flu shot, et cetera. So those are really our focus areas. And that's the high level overview of, of DSNP navigation. I love it. I I'm going to come back to you later on and we'll talk about how to build something like this. So folks who are just taking down notes about the results and want to get an understanding of how Ben and his colleagues at UHC built it. We'll get into that later on in the show. If you have questions for Ben or any of our panelists, please use the Q&A module. Don't use chat. We have too many people on today's uh, call live uh, to, to follow chat really closely. So we use the Q&A module to be able to take questions live uh, and incorporate them into the conversation. So feel free to help me moderate. Okay, uh, I wanna learn a little bit more now about what's going on at Optima Health. So uh, I'm gonna bring in Tracy Massey. Tracy's the Director of Government Programs over at Optima Health. Tracy, why don't you take about 30 seconds to introduce the organization and the health plan itself and then uh, a success story that you have helped uh, execute over there at Optima. Absolutely. Thank you, Eric. And um, I appreciate you and all the panelists for inviting me to um, share some, some bright spots in healthcare. Um, so first of all, Optima Health is a subsidiary of Centera Healthcare, which is an integrated delivery network. And we are in the Virginia Beach area is where we're headquartered. We do cover the state of Virginia and we have over 600,000 members in all lines of business, um, commercial, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, DSNP, 
over half of that membership falls in our Medicaid population, um, which I work very closely with. So um, that's a little bit about Optima Health, but I really want to get to the baby showers. And so as we talk about engaging members and trying to close care gaps, um, a lot of us know that low-income females tend to be disproportionately um, susceptible to adverse birth risk, like low birth rates or high infant mortality. And it's no different in Virginia. And we were finding that in many pockets um, within our population of women who just weren't getting their prenatal care or they weren't getting postpartum care. And so we tried to think of an innovative way to um, engage members, to make them feel like they were making better choices for their health. And so we came up with the idea of actually hosting baby showers. And so we do all of the fun things that you would do. You you play games and you have raffles and and all of that um, in the locations where the members live and work. But then we added in the component of really getting them the education that they were missing and to helping them get access to the care that they weren't having. And so in those, we educate them on things like breastfeeding or safe sleep or preeclampsia and gestational diabetes, a host of topics. And we run them um, quarterly. We place them in different regions within the state because you will find that there are, while there are things that are the same, there are things that are different and nuanced. And so we try to, to do that with the topics within the, the baby showers and just really stress the importance of focusing um, on their health. In the last 18 months, we've had just over 25 baby showers and about 150 of our Medicaid members have actually participated. Um, the numbers seem low, but for this population who sometimes is slow to engage or welcome something, uh, we're pretty proud of those numbers. Um, but even more importantly is of those who attend the baby shower, anywhere from 50 to 75% of the women go and get that prenatal visit that they normally might have skipped or not gotten. And about 31% of them show up for their postpartum uh, care. So it's, it's helping us to close some of the gaps that they would not have normally um, done. We engage with a lot of different community and faith-based organizations to help put on the baby showers. And so they will be presenters and, and guest speakers, and um, they do activities like um, baby yoga. Um, they show them how to do pediatric CPR, um, introduce them to resources like SNAP and WIC and, and things like that. Um, we also allow them to tour labor and delivery. So we will sponsor it at a hospital, a local facility. Um, sometimes it's some of our own facilities. Other times it's with um, other facilities in the area where the Medicaid population tends to do their deliveries. And it really helps them get familiar uh, and to start to build that trust relationship that's very important uh, with a Medicaid member and their health plan and their uh, providers that are there. So we've seen a lot of success in those uh, baby showers. We start by inviting them with a congratulatory message that says, congratulations, um, you're pregnant and you've been invited to the baby shower. We also have a dedicated person who will call each of the pregnant moms to personally invite them in addition to what they may receive in the mail or see on social media so that they get that personal touch. And it just so happens on our staff, it's a, a gentleman and he shows up at the baby showers and they love it when they meet him and they're like, oh, Nathaniel, you're who I talked to on the phone. And so um, it's just been a really rewarding experience for us as well as some of the members. And we've even had some that said, if it wasn't for Optima Health, we would never have even had a baby shower. Uh, we started them in person, uh, but then obviously the pandemic hit, but we very quickly realized it was important to still maintain this particular program. So we host them virtually. And it's our expectation that once the public health emergency ends, that we probably will move to a hybrid where we will do some in person and still continue to do some virtually because it's turned out to be a medium that um, the members are very receptive to. So that's a bit about the baby showers. I probably can go on and on about them, but um, it's really exciting to, to actually see the fruits of your labor. I have two follow-ups uh, before I go there. Ben, there's uh, two questions in the Q&A uh, the first one is from Jack, and the second one is from Karen. If you if you have time and you could 
type those in and then share them with everyone. Um, yeah. If they're too, if they're too, if they're too technical or too, just text me off, you know, through the chat uh, directly, and I'll I'll ask it to you later. Uh, right. So if it's easier to just do it verbally, uh, Tracy, I got some. You're not off the you're not off the hot seat yet. So t tell me, uh, so are, do you have plans to scale this? Because directionally, it seems like, you know, with the numbers that you shared, th there seems to be some absolute economic benefit when you get 50 to 75 percent of your uh, attendees to do a prenatal visit that probably is impacting healthcare costs big time and then uh, increasing the the, the appearance rate on postmortem care uh, postpartum care excuse me uh, that that's going to obviously reduce healthcare costs so are you how are you scaling this do you have plans to scale it Yes. So um, currently the state of Virginia, our state agency, the Department of Medical Assistance Services, divides the state into six regions. It's our intention by the end of 2022, we will host a baby shower in each of the regions every quarter. So ultimately we would have at least 24 is the minimum number, but we've also been approached by several different um potential partners, other hospitals, other locations like CHIP um, in Roanoke, different places that we could host additional baby showers. And so, yes, the intention is to, to scale up because we just have gotten that much interest um, from the members as well as the community who's been very um, embracing of the concept and, and working with us to deliver. So absolutely, it's the intent to scale up. And how are you getting, for, by the way, everyone should be doing this. I love this. <laughs> How are you getting your members to, to even consider it? Uh, are you making phone calls? Are you sending emails? How are you getting them to trust you not being the big bad evil health plan? Um, we're doing a little bit of all of that. Um, so we start off, we get a list um, from the state agency of members who are identified as pregnant moms because that's one of the qualifications for Medicaid. The second way is we have an outreach team that actually calls all of our newly enrolled members. We conduct a health screening and within that health screening, we ask um, medical health questions, but also SDOH questions and of which one of them is, are you or anyone in your household pregnant? And as soon as they self-identify, then we're like, great, we have something for you. And we have a baby shower, we have an event that we think that you would like. There's a lot of word of mouth. We find that some of our moms will register and then they actually bring another pregnant mom friend with them. And so obviously we don't turn anybody away, even if they're not our member, because the information is important to all pregnant moms. And so a lot of it's word of mouth and then engaging our community partners, different organizations. We have organizations like Urban Babies, who um, works with moms all the way through delivery and then up to a couple of years after, which then helps us get the babies um, immunized and things like that. And so really trying to do a 360, if you will, and engage everybody. So it's it's the trusted leaders. Um, we use some spiritual leaders in the faith-based um, organizations because a lot of members are going to listen to their spiritual guider. Um, and if my spiritual guider trusts the health plan, then I can trust the health plan. Um, we look to some of our larger um, OBGYNs who have a reputation, uh, who again, that trust factor. And then once they um, come to the first baby shower, see that we're not trying to sell anything. We're actually just trying to promote good health for them. When they do have subsequent um, children, it's one of the first things they reach out and ask, are you still having the baby showers we'd like to attend? So we, we try to do several different tactics. Love it. All right. So folks, you already have a, a navigator program for UHC. You already have a baby shower program. Uh, and we've got more coming as far as bright spots and success stories. So let's let's turn it over now to Anthem and Meryl Freeman. She's the regional vice president of inclusive policy and advocacy at Anthem. Uh, what are you doing to support expectant moms? Uh, thanks, Eric. Thanks, uh, colleagues on the phone and uh, folks that have tuned in today. What a great conversation. So, Eric, I love when you make comments like everybody should be doing that. So, and Tracy, I love it. We do baby showers too, and they are great. They're so engaging. It gets people really connected to peer supports, even like other moms um, and parents, you know, uh, who are experiencing pregnancy right now and the challenges that go with that. So, uh, baby showers are a great way to engage. Another way, I'll talk a little bit about doulas. Um, and so, you know, really very heavy on community-based, you know, intervention, um, and, and engagement. And 
Dula, you know, doula care, it's evidence-based that, you know, we consider a high value model, uh, improving birth outcomes for our preterm births and C-section rates as well. Really great at addressing racial disparities and increasing the quality um, of care that people can access and really reports a more positive self-reported birth experience, which I think is really important how people actually feel throughout uh, the birthing process. And, you know, one of our we have doula programs uh, in many of our states. I'm going to highlight a little bit about Florida now. Um, and the good thing about Florida, and we were very excited, is even when the state included doula services as an expanded benefit in the statewide Medicaid managed care uh, plans. And, you know, we got busy that I know you're going to ask, Michael, how do you get, how do you get contact with people? You know, so we got busy, you know, <laughs> we updated our member and provider materials um, to include doula services. So that begins to get socialized. And of course, those uh, materials are in, you know, uh, multiple languages reflecting the people um, we serve. We went into communities to educate members. Again, much of what Tracy said, right? You have to go to the faith-based organizations, community organizations, where are people, you know, you know, engaging with people they trust, accessing their care now. Um, and then, you know, working to make sure that all all of this is available, you know, to our pregnant members. Um, and it provides a lot of that emotional and physical support during pregnancy as well, during birth, postpartum. It's really, it's a relationship, uh, which also changes the trajectory uh, so that people really do have a safe and memorable and empowering birth experience is where we really try to get to. Um, we found the urgency behind it be during the pandemic because there were increased stressors clearly for, for everybody. Um, but for people who are pregnant, um, and so we really looked to change the way we were um, engaging at that point, and we were increasing pairings, right, where we were pairing doulas with pregnant members. We expanded our partnership through the National Doula Network at that point, um, and so we did communication campaigns. We funded uh, doula scholarships for certification so we could increase the number of doulas as well, so we're continuing um, to bring those numbers up so people have access. So in 2021 and 2022 thus far, we um, pair 262 of our members that are simply members in Florida with doulas. 228 um, of those individuals were our, uh, considered high-risk pregnancies. 53% um, of that you know, number um, were people who were Black, 20 are and 21% are, are Hispanic, Latino. So really trying to get into addressing the disparities as well. So everybody is paired with people who reflect um, and represent that they you know, really match with. Um, 110 of the members have given birth and 48 of them had the doula attend the birth with them. So that relationship is really strong. I could keep going. We've got lots of data right. and lots of numbers, but the yeah. good thing is the outcomes are really good and people have a really positive experience throughout that, even in, even in the pandemic. As do, do, do you measure that versus what I would call projected or forecasted NICU admissions or anything like that, where you could balance that out? Wow, we, we, of, of those 48% or of those 260, 228 high risk members, we would normally have seen 40% or 30% of them at Ba those babies end up in the NIC here and now, that, now it's going down. Is that a direction you guys look at? Yeah. So we get lots of data. I don't have a bunch of data in front of me, um, at, of course, <laughs> at the moment, but um, we decreased uh, C-section rates um, for people who had uh, doula. So non-doula, non 36.8%. Um, and then, uh, or doula, if they had a doula, it was 36.8%, non-doula, 51.9%, right? So we decreased um, that by 15%, which is really a big deal. Um, you know, to us, uh, preterm births, um, were decreased by 13%, you know, C-sections among Hispanic Latino women were decreased 12%. So we really continue to see that. And that's, you know, NICU, of course, you know, um, as well. And then we also track, um, so we track preterm births, um, gestational age, vaginal deliveries, prenatal care. So lots of data gets collected. And Let fortunately, me... it's one of the programs, right, that all of the numbers go in the right direction. This is all great stuff. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears now and, and let's now talk about communication and when we can't reach 
the individuals we need to reach. And so I'm going to bring in Sarah Ratner. She's the Senior Vice President of Government Programs at Acario Health. Sarah, what about those who aren't easily easy to connect with and what should the health plans and providers in the audience, what should, what should their approach be? Yeah, so um, just a little bit about Acario to set the stage for um, how we're helping to support this. So Acario's mission is to make the world a healthier place one person at a time. And what that means is that every member, we have to meet every member where they are at. Um, and we really have a focus on Medicare and Medicaid members, encouraging them to take actions to make them healthy, like screenings, colonoscopies, prenatal post uh, and postpartum, checkups, annual wellness visits. And as we've seen during the pandemic, these types of health actions and others have shifted increasingly to telehealth. And it's causing um, people who don't have that access to be left behind. And we've been studying this for since about January of 21. And there's a fundamental flaw with digital access. And it presumes that everybody has a way of accessing telehealth. And that's actually not true. Um, and for us focusing on this um, communication and multi-channel and omni-channel communication, is at the heart of giving people access. And so that's why Acario created this digital bridge program that we actually announced the other day. And there's a couple of reasons for this. And I'll um, cite a couple of statistics that go towards why. So 56% of adults that are earning less than $30,000 a year have no home broadband. 37% of lower income adults use a mobile phone as their main way to go online. And 47% of those 65 and older do not own a smartphone. And the last 80% of people who have access to free or reduced internet access do not even know about it. And so there's a problem that we need to recognize in healthcare that we are not getting to everybody who needs access. And some of uh, these individuals are the most critical population. And so what a digital bridge solution does is it addresses three legs of this stool. The first, it helps to connect people to uh, devices and electronics to actually be able to take that first step. Um, part of the program is establishing tablets that have the health plan information preloaded onto it so that it's very easy for a member or beneficiary to access their health plans portal and get them into a telehealth visit or working with a care navigator um, or whatever resources available to them. The second leg of the stool is broadband access. And as we know, people have internet access, but a lot of people don't have high-speed broadband access and the broadband access has to meet uh, the FCC's minimum broadband speed to actually be considered adequate broadband. And for those people who don't have broadband, there's hotspots available. We know rural health is a big issue. And so we see that and really understand that we need to help support that population as well. And then the last, which I'm sure we've all dealt with, is digital literacy and support services. So digital literacy, meaning some people don't know what certain aspects are as it relates to accessing telehealth. They don't know how to get onto a Zoom. They don't know how to download Zoom. Um, they don't know how to troubleshoot if they don't have internet access or their device isn't starting. And so that third leg is really helping to bridge that divide to give people the option to access the support that they need. And so when you combine all these together, we really feel like that's a way to help enable healthcare communication. And without those fundamental building blocks, the assumption that we can all leverage digital health and telehealth falls flat on its face because most people don't have one of three legs of the stool. 
Got it. So connect people to a device. Uh, you use an example of you distributing uh, tablets with preloaded healthcare information on it. Get them access to broadband as defined by FC, the FCC, what broadband is, and then support digital, little, digital literacy uh, and helping bridge that overall divide. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, so the digital bridge solution, I, I love that. Uh, actually, I'm gonna let, let's let's talk about health education. I'm gonna bring in Tracy Massey to, to talk about that. But it, it strikes me, uh, it, it may be worth for everyone. So I, I've been working with Acario and Sarah for I don't know three plus years now. Sarah's sick of me already, uh, but they have over the years uh, done some remarkable things and put a lot of that a lot of the accomplishments that they and their clients have had together into a blog and newsletter that has, is littered uh, with bright spots. And so uh, I wanted to call that out to everyone. In fact, Sherry, maybe we put a poll together. If folks want to uh, get on their blog, uh, their blog distribution, which I think is twice a month, uh, and they could unsubscribe anytime and get that information, just email to them. Uh, just click on yes on a poll that Sherry will throw up there and we'll get everyone that those bright spots and that content coming from a cario uh, twice a month right into your into your inbox. Uh, so Tracy, I want to bring you back on and talk about how you and Optima, uh, how you guys are addressing health education and, and literacy, the, the third the third leg in the in the three legged stool that uh, Sarah just uh, outlined for us. Um, sure, thanks. So when it comes to um, health literacy, if you look at the statistics, about 36% of the adult population um, is has low health literacy. When you translate that into a low income Medicaid population, um, that number soars to upwards of 70, 75%. Uh, and so with experiencing that, um, Optima Health again was looking for what is the solution that we could try to help our members in this space. And so we developed a health education and literacy program uh, where members can again take control of their own health by educating themselves. We offer um, 90 like, minutes. Can we, can we throw out the acronym? I mean, I love the acronym. HEAL. So nice. we'll heal you. <laughs> um, it is, uh, there's eight modules, they're 90 minutes each, and a member can go to one, two, or even all of them. We encourage them to go uh, to all of the classes because they are um, different topics. What we try to do is talk about things like, um, how do you properly take your medication? How do you read the back of your prescription bottle? Because if you can't read your prescription bottle, you're not going to be compliant with what you need to do to help you um, with whatever illness you have and to maybe prevent you from progressing in your um, disease state. We talk about healthy eating. Uh, we introduce members to um, ways to cook differently. We um, engage them with even different types of produce that they might not be aware of. They might not know what a star fruit is or what an avocado is. And so we do some show and tell um, when we do that. We also uh, talk about things like how do you engage with your doctor and your provider? There are many times when you go for an exam, whether you're um, well for your wellness visit or you're ill, and the doctor just sort of spews this is what's going on with you. This is what's happening. You need to do this. And you just sit there and sort of take it and you don't process it or you don't even ask questions. And a lot of it in the Medicaid population is maybe they feel like their question is a dumb question when in fact it's not. And so in that particular module, we try to um, help them prepare almost like doing interview skills. You know, here's the types of things you should really be asking your um, provider, which is going to help you be better in what you need to do for your, your health. We also um, have are recently adding some maternal education components, um, not to just talk about the positive things, but even some of the negative things that you could potentially experience like miscarriages and what are the signs of that or that you may be uh, having hypertension or gestational diabetes and even if you ultimately end up experiencing a miscarriage there's grief that goes along with that and so i um, trying to educate them on that uh, we have another topic which is really how to use the appropriate provider am i going to my primary care physician am i going to the urgent care 
or am I going to the emergency room? Uh, in the Medicaid population, there is a high emergency department utilization. And many times members are using the emergency room as if it was their primary care doctor. And um, some of it could be convenience of hours. Uh, some of it could just be I didn't know that this was something that could wait. You know, if you have your child, your baby who's stuffed up and it seems like they can't breathe, you're going to the emergency room. Uh, whereas maybe there's something that you could have done and gone, you know, over to the primary care doctor and tried how to use the nurse advice lines. And so that's the intent of the health education classes is to really to address them. And we do target specifically those that um, are low literate and even first time um, English speaking population. So uh, it's become an important part of our curriculum. We have a host of other literacy types of programs that we do, but that's one of the, the bigger and larger ones too. Just like the baby showers, we were doing them in person. Uh, COVID hit, now we do them virtually. And again, when PHE ends, then we will have a hybrid um, portion of how we do those uh, classes. Thank you the HEAL program. So I, I, I want to circle back uh, to the UHC Navigator program. I had said when, after Ben had been on last, that we we're going to come back to this. Uh, before I ask Ben his follow-up question, uh, we our next live event, we're going to have a few recorded shows drop over the next uh, uh, coming weeks, folks. Our next live event is going to be May 19th. Uh, and so I'll be traveling the next few weeks. So we're going to hold off on the next live show to May 19th. If you want to pre-register now and have us just register for you, we're going to be covering Medicare risk and quality and how to identify your veteran population in a way that's going to increase compensation from the government, but also uh, reduce your total cost of care. It's going to be a really interesting discussion. So if you want to pre-register for that, Sherry will put up a poll and we will sign you up for that for May 19th at 12 p.m. East Coast time, as we always do. So Ben, around the Navigator program, how, uh, if, if, you, if I put your professor hat on and everyone was in class right now, how would people in our student body go about building a similar program as the UHC Navigator program? What would be their roadmap? Yeah, so um, Eric, I can break this down in two parts. There's the organizational piece and the operational piece. From, a, from an organizational perspective, it starts with getting alignment that we're going to invest the time and the effort in a better way of serving people, our decent members in this case. Um, for us, that um, alignment of what success looks like and understanding of what are we trying to do, we focused around providing that great service, connecting members with the healthcare system and in addressing social determinants of health, which asterisks, I saw a couple of questions on what that means and I can come back to that if we have time. Um, that what those what success looks like might be different for different populations, different organizations, but you got to get everyone to stack hands on what you're trying to accomplish and why. And that's got to cut across technology, product, operations, leadership. Everyone's got to be on the same page. For us, in terms of how we build this program, and I'd say most service programs like this, um, it, it all starts with the people that you have doing this, right? Service is about people helping people for the most part. So we focus on getting the right people. For us, that's people with a passion for helping others. It's great if they have healthcare experience, but we're looking for people that are drawn to serving others. And we're also looking for people that are good at and hopefully enjoy solving problems. Uh, many of the issues that our navigators confront when serving members are, are complicated and, and they've got to figure it out on their own. We prepare our navigators through training. They go through months of classroom training and then a few more months of on the job training that's intensive coaching and oversight. Um, and then we arm them with information. Uh, this is one where we bring information about the members, their benefits, their health history, all the other programs and touch points they have across, across the healthcare ecosystem and bring that together in a more holistic and member centric way. So we can really give our navigators a broad and comprehensive view of what's going on with each member they're, they're working with. The most important thing on this is getting out of the navigator's way. Let them work with the members, build the relationship, solve the problems. Don't go overboard on detailed processes or scripting. That takes the humanity out of this relationship and experience, but empower them to do, do what we're focused on here, that engagement, that service, and helping them positively engage in the healthcare system. And is that covered? Do you want to? Yeah. So, and on COH, I saw a couple of questions on this one. So just trying, maybe oversimplifying this a little bit. 
as we're addressing social determinants of health with our members, first, it's understanding what those gaps are. Sometimes that comes out through conversations between our members and our navigators. Sometimes we get that information from the health risk assessment or from our clinical team or from a local social worker and bringing all that into that holistic member centric view that we spoke about earlier so that we know yep. what the issue is. Then we intervene. Um, sometimes that's helping them access benefits that they're not using. We have transportation benefits for our decent members. We have food and over the counter benefits. So helping them engage with those benefits if their benefits um, aren't available to them or they're exhausted, we engage them with community-based organizations. So we have an established network of you know, food banks, charitable organizations, faith-based organizations that we connect people to. And that's complicated because how you help someone get access to food in Minot, North Dakota is different than someone in Biloxi, Mississippi. So how do we have that network and engage people? And in some cases, we're also helping engage members in programs that might be available to them, uh, subsidized housing, SNAP, and, and, and food stamps, things like that. The, we understand, we intervene, and then we do a closed loop on the back end to make sure we follow up with them after the fact. Did they get the support and services they needed? Uh, depending on what that intervention is, that could be a couple of days or a couple of weeks after we've connected them with the program to make sure they've got the help. And if not, we kind of start over and try to find a different path to getting them solutions. Thank you. Thanks for that. I, I want to talk about engagement vehicles to drive health equity. I mean, how are organizations doing that? I'm going to ask Sarah to come back on, Sarah Ratner at Acario. Sarah, you get to work with all different kinds of healthcare organizations. How are they, how are they leveraging current engagement vehicles to drive health equity? So health equity, I mean, you could drive a truck through that term right now. And a lot of people um, uh, think of it as um, synonymous with SDOH. Um, there was actually a, a post from CMS yesterday speaking about how they're going to be focusing on health equity and, and what it really means. And the way the market is speaking about it is really centering on how do we help drive action and outcomes for those um, that don't have the same um, parity based on their race, their gender, their sexual orientation or gender identity. And one of the most difficult problems right now for the industry is actually knowing who falls into that category who, who is um, dealing with gender identity issues? What is somebody's ethnicity? Because it really influences how people access care. For example, in Minnesota, individuals who are Somali um, maternity patients, there has been a huge effort to focus on that population because of the historic mistrust of accessing prenatal care in um, what they would say is a white person system and trying to bridge that to help get those individuals access. But you can't do it unless you know that that person is Somali. Um, NCQA has leaned into this heavily through their health equity accreditation and their health equity accreditation plus. Um, and that focus is really on um, encouraging plans to start collecting this data. We're seeing state Medicaid departments actually um, create financial incentives for plans who start to collect this data. Um, New York has done some really interesting work in how it's creating structures to support this. Um, and for Acario, the, the easiest and simplest way to get access to this information is at the starting point of somebody's journey, whether it's you're there completing an HRA, they're speaking to their care manager, they're completing an SDOH survey. So if you can collect it very early on, there's a greater ability to influence positively the way that member engages um, so that it is meaningful and relevant to them and, and their culture, ethnicity, and, and SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity. Uh, folks, uh, 
you've heard me say this if you're regulars on the show i i we we produce this programming on your behalf and we need your input and feedback to continue to provide you uh valuable content each and every episode so uh at this point probably right now you're getting another email from me i know uh enough's enough right uh we're we're going to ask your feedback about the show and what are the topics we should be covering for all of you. So just ask you the favor of taking the time to complete that. And we will send you a few reminders to complete that two minute, three minute feedback form uh, if you do not complete it. So uh, thank you in advance for that. Uh, I'm going to uh, bring back uh, Meryl Friedman from Anthem uh, and, and we'll stay on the topic of social determinants of health. And, and when you identify these gaps, Meryl, how are you addressing them? And for example, what would, what's Anthem doing around matching uh, social determinants and homelessness uh, and getting them getting your homeless members to the to the right solution sure thank you uh, thanks for all the great ideas and the great conversation thus far uh, everybody's doing really great work which uh, helps uh, just every individual person as well as communities so when we look at social drivers of health and we have lots of efforts going on around supporting people experiencing food insecurity driving to food security um, helping with employment, transportation, right? I, all of the drivers that we, we talk pretty readily about. Housing and homelessness is always, you know, it it's, can feel more challenging to many people, right? Uh, housing is not covered by Medicaid, you know, um, finding room and board for people may be more difficult even than getting access to some nutritious food. So I think we all work, everybody on here has been in many of the same meetings and we're all trying to make sure that we can connect people experiencing homelessness or housing instability to services and resources through us and through the community. So we started, um, we've got lots of different programs and I, Eric's always like, Meryl, pick one. So I'm trying to, but we have several. Um, but in many of our states, we've reached out to local continuums of care to become HMIS, the Homelessness Management Information System. So we've become HMIS users. And what that allows you to do is to access the local homeless databases and that's just, it's another tool that we've been able to now use in helping to locate and engage uh, with members who may be more difficult to find, whether it be because they don't want to be contacted right now, they may not have, you know, cell phones uh, available. And if they do have one, it may not be charged, they may not have minutes on it, they may be in shelters. Um, so we can actually, through becoming HMIS users, we have better access to be able to find them and it allows us to see if members are engaged in street outreach or shelter, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing programs. Um, and it also identifies the organizations that are working with the member, if there's somebody else involved with them, which allows us to reach out and participate together in coordinating care and helping people to you know, build trust and you know, foster that engagement. So People may be interested in getting access to more care and supportive services, preventive services, some acute health care needs for sure, uh, but gives us the opportunity to bring our services and resources to the table. Um, I feel like I'm very Florida example-y today, uh, but in Florida, we were able to, um, through this process, find a member we had not been able to connect with. Um, he is a person with HIV AIDS. He was very sick at that particular time, lost well over 65 pounds. And once we went through the data matching through these resources together with the COCs, we were able to locate him um, in the shelter. We got to know him, connect with him, a healthcare case manager involved. We got back on medications, accessing care, um, and it can be pretty life-saving. Lots of the examples that have been shared today and on your show frequently um, are pretty life-saving to people. So in Florida alone, we're in 75% of the COCs across the state. So we're finding more of our members, being able to connect them to more resources. Um, and then you establish those really great relationships, right? With the COCs, the continuums of care, city stakeholders, county stakeholders, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, everybody's coming together. Um, and everybody being at that table, sharing the information, data matching, um, and finding housing um, that is suitable and acceptable to the person, right? So we tend to work um, with people who, well, let me stop there for a minute. I'll go, I'll go back. But we're finding people that we knew were experiencing homelessness, but through this process, we're actually finding people who were actively homeless that we didn't know, which is great because not everybody shares that. And now we know that and we can help connect them. 
Um, so in Miami-Dade County alone, we've matched over 300 members and 232 of those members were successfully housed, are successfully housed, finding people that speak the same language or doing better communication, better connection. Um, and it just opens all of that communication through all of the people that are involved in communities to help people become uh, more stably housed. And then quickly, I'll just um, add one at our blue triangle, uh, low barrier housing in Indiana, that um, we it's hitting its five year uh, anniversary this May. Um, but it's a strength based, low barrier, motivational interviewing approach, right, to engaging people who may have mental health and substance use disorders, but they are actively homeless at that time too. Um, and 96% of them remain housed. They've su successfully transitioned. And that's a really big number. I think that's what we all wanna see, you know, across our communities is that people um, can transition from housing programs to being stably housed and re-engaging with family and community um, and getting people, you know, to where they are finding those resources. And we just, you just have to, you have to be where people are without being cliche and say, we meet people where they are. <laughs> you actually have to go and be present. Well, let's go there for a second because, uh, and just a public service announcement to our panel and our, our listeners, uh, we only have eight, nine minutes left. So I'm going to bop around a bit and make sure I, we could capture uh, as much of uh, the questions and themes of the questions uh, as we can. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to go local uh, right now because uh, there seems to be a little, a lot of questions related to that. Sarah, how can organizations better uh, be better enabled to transition their care strategy to local? Because that seems to be obviously a big theme in healthcare. I'm a big believer in like this combination of feet on the street, which I think was mm -hmm. mentioned in the chat with CHWs and virtual care combined. H how are you helping and seeing health plans and, and ACOs be better enabled to tr transition? Yeah, so um, there's two approaches. One, you know, there's there's large organizations that work across the country that enable access to different local programs and services. And those are great because they cover a wide area, but also important is working with local aggregators who really understand the market very, very well and can say, you know, here's the food shelf that you should actually use because the one that's being recommended is closed. Um, one of the things that we've worked on is using peer mentors who have shared lived experiences with the beneficiaries so that they also can advise on the food shelf that they used to use, or where would they go, um, what transportation would, would they use, especially if there's cultural differences. And so combining that macro level with those large programs, but also layering in the, um, you know, very local component is important in order to serve a, a member very well. Like that. Hey, uh, Sherry's going to hate me. I, I'd be curious, Sherry, if you could put up a poll on what organizations here today are using peer mentors to help with their, a local strategy. I'd just be curious to share it with the group. Uh, it's going to take Sherry a little time to manufacture that poll, but I'll see if she can pull it off. Uh, let, let's, I'm going I'm to start jumping around here and taking some questions. Uh, I, I want to talk about strategies to reach the unreachable. Uh, Gina asks, what strategies do you employ to reach the unreachable, unreachable population? I'll, I'll throw that. Uh, let's throw that to Ben first. And then if Trace, if you want to jump in, if you have anything, go ahead. Yeah, so our, as I was talking about earlier, our inbound and outbound activities have gotten us a pretty good um, connection rate and engagement rate, but we've done two other things to really stretch that. W one is we've expanded the, the languages we support. When we launched this, it was English and Spanish. We've added um, several other languages, uh, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Russian, I'm, I'm missing several, but we've gone from covering about 89% of our membership to 97 plus. And then there's hundred languages to get the last three percent so we're a little gapped there um and other times where we've had people we just couldn't you know we've partnered with the cario in the past of here's some people we can't find can you use some of your um technology to help us find some of these people through some other contact information you might have so th that's those are the two areas i'd say we've used historically beyond our inbound and outbound which get, get us the most so Tracy, do you, I don't know if I'm putting you on the spot and Ben, I'm going to come back to you about the navigator program because there's a bunch yeah. of questions here, but uh, 
Tracy, how do you, how are you guys reaching the unreachable? Um, so very similar to, to Ben, we always say have the inbound and outbound, but we do put a large focus on working with our community organizations uh, because they know where the members are. They service the members. And so we work together to, to wrap around them, build that trust that we've uh, talked about. Uh, but then we're also trying to leverage, similar to, to Merrill, is some of the data and the electronic and, the, and technology. So when you go through claims data, for instance, and you find information, um, and then you're able to build out programs based on some of the people's needs and the services that they're um, putting out there. But uh, we use the traditional you know, social media and calling. Uh, the other thing we do is we really have created these uh, advisory committees where the members come in and give us their feedback. So instead of us telling the members what they need to know or what they want to hear or how it should be, they actually tell us their preference of how they want it. And so when you start to engage on the level that they want to be engaged on, uh, then you have a lot more of a success um, rate. So there's, there's several that we do, and I'm sure that that's what many of the panelists use as well. Ben, I'm going to put you back on. This is going to be rapid fire, all right? Get ready. Okay, let's see what we can do here. No. First, first of all, what is the ratio of the patient panel to navigator? And then are you using contact centers? And what's your required specif specialized training for these folks? Yeah, so the the panel size varies a lot by population member needs. So that's a complicated answer that I need smarter people to help me understand. But we do use contact centers. Um, but our, most of our people are work at home now and have been for the last couple of years, I think, across many industries. And as far as um, specific uh, like requirements for our navigators, it, there's no licensure required. These are non-clinical people. These are people that we through the interview process, we ensure this is a job that they're passionate about helping people. It's more of that service centric orientation and mindset, not a necessarily an external licensure. Well done. All right. Good stuff. That was rapid. Uh, another rapid one for Sarah. Do we have a perspective on how solutions like Acario can also be a tool for providers to better engage members? Yeah, I, I mean, they can be used the exact same way. Providers, especially those that are risk-bearing providers these days, um, need to actively manage their, their members. They need to reach them in omni-channel ways, and, and they need to be sensitive to cultural differences. And so as members or as um, providers look at doing outreach and continuing to get their patients back into to appointments and get them live, it's a great way to, to leverage Acario. Right. All right, this could maybe our last one. I'm gonna throw this to Merrill first, but Merrill, you may wanna punt it. I'll let our other health plan uh, roundtable participants be ready to jump in. What tool do you use to assess social determinants of health? Do you use a CMS tool? Um, so, so many, so if CMS tells us we should be using a tool, then we typically use that tool because um, uh, that makes sense. So there are several out there. We have some sort of Anthem created ones built on our health risk assessments. Prepare is another one that gets uh, used and is also just dictated, but often states will tell us which tool they want us to use. Anyone else wanna quickly jump in here with a rapid answer? Oh, yeah. And so like Merrill, we use a um, state sponsored um, health screening. Previously in Virginia, there are six health plans that um, do the screenings for Medicaid and we were all using our own. Um, and so when it came time for reporting, it wasn't always apples to apples. And so probably about four or five years ago, all of the managed care organizations came together with the state and agreed on a uniform screening tool, which we use. Um, there's an initial one, and then there's a comprehensive one that we do on the back end once a member um, identifies that they have more complex issues. Good stuff. All right, we're at the top of the hour. I just want to remind everyone, each episode, we are just working hard to, to to make sure that this 60 minutes that you spent with us is time well spent. Uh, we take the privilege of having your attendance and your attention for the hour very seriously, whether you're listening live or via the podcast. Uh, and to that end, we need your feedback to ensure we're covering the right 
topics and content to benefit you and your organization. So please uh, fill out that survey that I just emailed you. If you're listening on the podcast, email me at feedback at sharedpurposeconnect.com. We look at all of those and we will listen to you and in turn create episodes that meet your needs. Thank you all for listening. This has been your Bright Spots in Healthcare podcast. Take care, everyone.